Welcome to the creative brain of Dean Hawk. Get ready to be challenged, inspired, and equipped to become a better ministry leader. Hey, welcome back to those of you that enjoy the Dean Hawk Leadership Podcast. This is Dean. It's a pleasure to come and share with you each month. We release a new podcast on the 15th of every month. And so welcome to November as we're getting geared up and ready for the holidays. I want to encourage you to check out DeanHawk.com where I have all of my uh, teaching series, notes, outlines, PowerPoints, graphics, uh, sermon bumpers, videos that are available for free just to bless you, help you, and assist you in any way, shape that we can. Um, we just released the new series that I did this fall called Growing Up Spiritually and a great look at how to grow, teaching your church the, the four stages of spiritual growth and how they can grow and mature and what those aspects are and helping them develop. Um, and then another thing that we just completed this last weekend, we had our volunteer appreciation dinner where we uh, catered in a meal and just blessed all of our uh, faithful volunteers. And every year we bring in some kind of talent or entertainment. I wanted to tell you about somebody that I would highly, highly recommend. His name is Nazareth, Comedian Nazareth. And he his website is Nazareth USA. Com. He was born in Nazareth, Jerusalem, and he is a crazy, awesome comedian. He did our volunteer uh, banquet on Friday night. Then he stayed over and preached and did all three of my services uh, this past weekend and did those and just did a phenomenal job. He's great to work with, easy to work with. I highly recommend. And so when you call him, say, hey, Dean Hawk told me. Dean Hawk told me because I'm, I'm I'm telling him I need a commission. Not really. But hey, I would love to know if you have them in and let him know that you heard it here on the website. Hey, there's something that's been going on in the body of Christ if you've been watching social media and, and different things that I want to address. And uh, this month's topic is on women in church leadership question. Women in church leadership, the big question. And I realize that some of you have very strong opinions about women's role in the church, women teaching men, teaching from the platform. And uh, I, I realize that um, it's, it's kind of a, a black or white uh, area for many, many people. And I, my goal is not that I believe I'm going to change anyone's mind because when you listen to my perspective and my breakdown on the scripture, you'll say, well, you're just tainting it your direction. And, and I might say those on the other side are turning it towards their direction. So I want to talk though about can women preach in church? Can they teach to men? And I'm just going to be up front. I full heartedly 100% believe that women are called, anointed, gifted, and have equal value in the body of Christ to men and that I, as a man, can learn from the wisdom that women have learned and seen in life, in the scriptures, and, and uh, their perspective of what they have learned in their walk and relationship with God. And so what my goal is, is to empower some of you that would maybe have like-kind beliefs to give you some scripture and to break down um, um, some passages and to give you some evidence of where I see that Paul was not limiting women's role in the church, but he was truly empowering them. And so I just want to dive into what was was going on in that in that time and season. Um, in that in that culture of that day, in Jesus' day, in Paul's day, men were more important, more valuable than than women. They, they were generally believed to be inferior, and, and I believe that the scriptures are taken out of context, and the two primary scriptures are 1 Timothy 2 that says, a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach 
or to have authority over a man, she must be silent. The other scripture is 1 Corinthians 14, for God is not a God of disorder of peace. As in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in church. Here's what, here's what, some believe today that women should shut up, that women should go home, that women should submit to men, that they are, are that, that men are better, that women are less than, and that it is wrong, it is an error for a woman to teach a man. And, and there are those that believe that for it's wrong for a woman to stand on a platform, to stand behind a, a pulpit, and to teach or preach to a mixed congregation. And they say, well, they can teach other women, and they can teach children, and, and those kinds of things. I believe wholeheartedly that women are called, gifted, and anointed, and a valuable part of the body of Christ. And I believe that women are not inferior, and women are not second class. I have female pastors on staff. I have female pastors that speak from the platform on Sunday morning. In Acts chapter 10 and verse 34, Peter began to speak and he says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. I don't believe that God shows favoritism between the sexes. And, and Peter thought that, that the gift of God, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, was only for the Jews. And God said, no, it's for the Gentiles as well. And so some sign of the times that were going on in the era, era of Jesus and Paul's time, what was going on in the culture. Women were less than a man. They were not allowed to go into public into a public assembly. They could not attend the temple services. They were meant to be out of sight, quiet, and not seen. And the law said that for them to go out in public, they must have their face covered. And all attention was given to the men, that the women could not own property. They could not have citizenship. They had no role or public could not have public speech. It would be very similar to the Muslim countries today, and it was very similar in the Roman world as well, that women could not receive an inheritance uh, only in very rare instances, that women could not initiate divorce, and that when babies were born, they were washed and the baby was brought to the father. If it was a boy, he held it up and blessed the child. If it was a girl, he wouldn't even touch it, and he gave the command for it to be fed so it would not die. In other words, in the culture of that day, boys were winners, girls were losers. Men married, married, at the age of approximately 25 to 30, and the women married as young as 12 years old was a Roman law, and mostly they married in their teen years. Women never asserted herself uh, themselves because of the age difference that was happening in the marriage. Roman girls were considered the legal property of their fathers, and then at marriage they became the legal property of their husband. And the new owner would place a wedding ring on the finger to signify a business transaction had taken place. And so uh, a woman was considered, it was considered below a woman's dignity to go out in public. Well, I believe that Paul had a revelation and he began to bring a cultural shift in the church world. In the church in Antioch, Paul, Paul stirred up tradition and, and uh, Acts chapter 13, it says, now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Mannion, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And this is one of the most powerful verses where we see society of the first century was completely divided by rank, by status, by nationality, and by race. And the categories that were just described here in Acts chapter 13, they did not mingle. They did not associate. And every division sitting in the same room serving the same God, and there was no strife. 
because you had Barnabas, who was from the island of Crete. He was a businessman. He was a non-religious Jew and had no theological training. Simeon, who we also uh, we, we called Niger, was a Latin word, which means he was a black man. Niger was, was his nickname. It was not an insult or considered degrading. Now, well, we've crossed these boundaries. It was not just a Jew sitting with a Gentile, but with a black man. And there was such camaraderie on this team. There was a love and a value and appreciation. Lucius of Cyrene was located in northern Africa. He was a slave that had been purchased and transported to his new home in Antioch. This man was the property of slave owners who had Latinized his name. He serves at the same table of a devout Jew, a businessman, and, and Simeon. And then we have Mannion, who was of nobility. He, uh, one scholar describes him as what we would call a small king. He's a man of wealth, education, and no nobility. And at the same table of cultural standards, he was considered a pagan or a Gentile. So we have a Jew, we have a Gentile, we have a king, we have a slave. And then we see Saul of Tarsus. Um, he was, he was uh, despised. At the world at this time, Jews despised Gentiles. But when Gentiles hear the Jews speak, they would say, stop talking that dog language. Jews despised Romans because the Romans were their occupiers. Gentiles were considered pagans because of their sexual immorality and their pagan gods. And so we have highly committed Jew, an African, a slave, a Roman nobility, and Saul, the only one at the table that is theologically trained. And I love how Paul wrote in the book of Galatians chapter 3 and verse 26. He said, For you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus, that there are no longer sex and, and classes of, of culture and society, and that one person is not better than the other, that in Christ we all have equal value. In Christ, he goes on, he said, there is neither Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free. In 1 Corinthians 1, he writes and he says, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. Rather, be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. For some members of Chloe's household have told me about your quarrels, my dear brothers and sisters. You see, when we come into the house of God, when we come into the family of God, there is no race, there is no sex, there is no color, there is no rich, there is no poor, there is no uneducated or educated. We are one and we come in that unity. Now, I want to give you my take on a biblical perspective of where the role we see women in scripture. In Genesis 1 27 it says God created man in his own image. In the image of God he created him. Male and female God created them. In Genesis 2 18 it says it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Other translations say I'm going to make a help mate for him. Now I think men have said well yes she's my helper. In other words kind of my servant. She is less than me. She is here to help and assist me. Well if you break it down and you go back into the Hebrew it's a combination of t two words. I'm not going to ezer uh, n e g e d. I don't know how you pronounce that, but the word ezer is is actually the word helper. It means to come alongside. It's not a subservient peon in life. It's the same Hebrew word used throughout the Old Testament to describe God as our helper. That, that, that it's coming alongside. If I, in other words, if I would help with someone with their homework, it would mean I would go to someone, uh, if I needed help with my homework, I would go to someone who is wiser than me to help or assist me. The word neged or uh, N-E-G-E-D means equal. 
And so if you combine those together, it means equal helper, to be partners in life, not one of domination or control, but one of equally giving and blessing. It says in Genesis 3.12, the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. It didn't say the woman you gave me representing property, the woman you put here with me. For centuries, women have been viewed as property. I believe that Eve was on equal ground and equal status in God's eyes as Adam was. It's interesting to me throughout the book of Proverbs that wisdom is referred to in the feminine pronoun, that for wisdom is more profitable than silver and her wages are better than gold. Wisdom is more precious than rubies. Nothing can desire can compare with her. She offers you long life in her right hand and riches and honor in her left. Isn't it intriguing that wisdom is referred to in a female sense? I believe I can gain wisdom from another female, that a female can teach me, help me, grow me, stretch me, and expand me. In 1 Corinthians 7, it says, the husband should fill, fulfill his marital duty to his wife, and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Paul put them on equal ground. Contrary to the law and the culture of the day, Paul said that each of our bodies do not belong to ourselves. And then we go and we look at the role of women in the birth of Jesus Christ. The world's ancient belief was that the father was the source of life for a for a child. Ancients believed that the male's semen contained tiny human beings that had been formed in the man's head. And this belief led to the Greek headship concept, that the woman was only the soil for the miniature human to grow. They And, and so basically, women were seen as the soil or seen as the dirt and were treated like dirt. And what I love is the angel of the Lord did not go and talk to Joseph first. He came, the messenger of the Lord came directly to the female, to Mary, and said, Greetings, you highly favored. The Lord is with you. Now, notice where you see and what you see Jesus doing in, in ministry. Throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus teaching on the hillside. He taught in the temple, but we see the feeding of the 5,000 and the 4,000. Well, what was the culture of the day? Women were not allowed into the temple. Jesus teaching in a non-temple place opened the door for not only women, but also children to come and to hear the good news, to hear the love of God, to see the miracles firsthand. We see that, that Samuel anointed uh, uh, David to be king of Israel, and he poured the oil over his head. In the Old Testament, people were ordained and anointed for ministry by the anointing oil. And a symbol of God's spirit upon David to be king was that anointing. So think about this. When Jesus was anointed as king, when Jesus was anointed, it was done by two women. In John chapter 12, it says six days before the Passover, Jesus arrived at Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus had raised from the dead. And they were at a dinner. And it says, then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume, and she poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair and the fragrance of the perfume filled the house. In Matthew 26, while Jesus was in Bethany, a home of a man named Simeon the leper, a Simeon, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. The disciples saw this and they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. It was probably Judas who wanted to steal from him. 
And he said, it says, Jesus was aware of this, said, why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. And, and what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Remember, this was an act of worship, and, and we need to follow the example of this woman. At the resurrection, Jesus, was, Jesus honored women, I believe, by appearing first to Mary Magdalene. And women were the first to find the empty tomb. And Jesus told them, go, you women go and tell others that, that I'm alive. The first people to proclaim the resurrection of Jesus Christ were women. I see that women have a definitive role in proclaiming the good news to all. If a woman could not teach a man or talk to a man, then they would have never been able to tell the original 11 disciples that remained that Jesus was alive, he had resurrected from the dead. Jesus died for all of us, not just men. He died for men and women with absolute equality. A male soul is not more valuable than a female soul. That Jesus died equally for every race, for every group, for every culture, for every sex, for every demographic of people, Jesus gave his sacrificial life. Then on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 1, it says that a group of 120 men and women were gathered, and they were waiting on the promise, men and women. And in Acts chapter 2, it says all of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. It didn't say the men received first. It didn't say that the women had to wait until the men transferred the ministry to them. They all received, they were esteemed on an equal platform with the men, with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Then we see, and we talk about women in ministry. The two passages I shared with you, 1 Timothy 2, 1 Corinthians 14. The, the scriptures uh, that were based from Paul, hear me, here is my interpretation. His instructions to Timothy uh, the church at Ephesus, and to the church at Corinth. Paul was not attempting to quench women. He was attempting to bring order within the church because women did not know how to behave or act in church because they had never been invited to be there. In fact, Paul was trying to teach women how to behave in church so they could be there with all of the guys. We see a reference to Lois and Eunice. Paul's words uh, to Timothy in, in 2 Timothy 1.5, it says, I've been reminded of your sincere faith, which you first which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. That these two women had an impact on Timothy's life. And how did Timothy get that same faith? Because they taught him. Well, but he was a child. I'm going to tell you what. I've gained wisdom from my mother and father beyond my childhood years. They have continued to teach and instruct me throughout my life. And then we see a reference to public prayer in 1 Corinthians 11. He gives women the right to pray publicly, to prophesy publicly, and to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. It says in verse 5, And every woman who prays and every woman who prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head is just as though her head were shaved. This is the first time in public history that we see in Scripture that women are being encouraged to speak out and to use their gift. We have a reference in uh, uh, the book of Acts to Aquila and Priscilla and, and uh, Priscilla and Aquila. And in Antioch, they were 18 months with Paul in Antioch. And the first time Paul meets them, he referred to them as Aquila, the husband, and to his wife, Priscilla. And, and Paul does the unthinkable in the Gentile churches. There is no evidence that this happened in the Jerusalem churches. Since there is no distinction, women are invited into the church and to use their gifts within the church setting. In Acts chapter 18 and verse 18, it said, Paul stayed on in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla 
the wife, and Aquila. And she emerged as the one with the gifts um, in that marriage. Priscilla, and oh yeah, her husband, Aquila. And in verse 24, it says, in Acts 18, it says, Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus, and he was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great favor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue, when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. That the two of him, two of them, taught him and instructed him. In Romans chapter 16 and verse 3, it says, Greet Priscilla and Aquila my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me, not only, but not only I, but all the churches of the Gentiles are grateful to them that they were both seen and valued and esteemed as leaders. It said, greet also the church that meets at their house. They were functioning in the office of a pastor. They were pastoring these people. And Jesus recognized the teaching gift, the pastoral gift that was upon Priscilla, as well as her husband, Aquila. And so, um, as, as we look and as we, we process, um, it's, it's been taught that there were actual scholars in the 2nd and 3rd century who proposed that it might have been Priscilla that wrote the book of Hebrews. I don't know. I don't have an opinion on it. I'm just sharing that, that there is a, some that would believe that maybe she is the one that actually penned a book in our modern day scriptures of the day. And had, had she not met with the Apostle Paul, her gift would have never been unlocked. And there are women who are loaded with gifts and talents and abilities and a divine calling. And I believe men, in their pride, in their ego, in their uh, uh, inflatedness of their head, believe that somehow they are too good to hear the wisdom and the teaching of another woman. And, 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 and I'm just going to tell you, it's their culture, it's their belief system. I do not see where you can find that within Scripture. Let's wrap this up. Uh, I believe my God is not a male chauvinist. And in Romans 16, 1, it says, Paul acknowledged a female deacon, uh, Phoebe, who was a deacon. And it doesn't mean that only men can be pastors or bishops. He said, I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant. In the Greek, the word is minister of the church of Sincrea. I ask you to receive her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints and give her any help she may need from you, for she has been a great help to many people. Paul said, Phoebe has been a great help to me, including me. And in the Greek, the word helper is pro, prostatus, and it has the, the uh, donation that someone stronger helping the weaker. And we see that in, in Josephus, who was the Jewish historian during Paul's lifetime, used the same word to describe Caesar. The leader respected and feared by all of the known world was used by this same Greek word that Phoebe is referred to. Caesar was the prostatus of the universe. And Phoebe has been declared a champion by Paul. And then lastly, let's talk about uh, as a Bible, as a bishop overseer, uh, a leader, that I believe there are no restrictions for women, just as there are no restrictions for men. In 1 Timothy 3.1, it says, Here is a trustworthy saying. It says, If anyone. In the King James Version, it says man. All the other translations transcribe this as anyone. If anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, or other translations say a bishop, he desires a noble thing. It does not use the word man in the original Greek. That word was inserted by the King James translators. The Greek says, if anyone, a reference to male or female. And then in Paul's personal testimony in Romans 16, 
He says in verse 7, he says, and Andronicus and Junius, my relatives who have been in prison with me, they are outstanding among the apostles and were in Christ before I was. Male and female apostle, husband and wife of the same language when he refers to the other apostles. In verse 12, he says, Greet Tryphena and Tryphosa, these women who work hard in the Lord, for they were twin sisters, both called in to the ministry. And it says, Greet my dear friend Persis, another woman who has worked very hard in the Lord. It says, Greet Philagogus, Julia, Nereus, and his sister, and Olympus, and all the saints with them. He salutes the women right beside the men. And so as we wrap this up, what does all this mean? I believe that there is a valuable place for men and women within the body of Christ and that women can teach in the church. I would encourage you as pastors and leaders to empower the women to take this podcast, take my notes, take the scriptures, preach it to your church, and empower and recognize the gifts that you have within the body of Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1.10, Paul wrote, I appeal to you, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in the church. So there's my take on it, gang. There's my approach. I hope that you'll check us out every month on the 15th of each month. We release a new leadership podcast. I've started a new blog that I'll be uh, releasing, uh, just a, a, a an article or two. I don't know how many I'm going to write a month. Just giving you some thoughts, some ministry ideas. Can't wait to be with you next month in uh, December. I'm going to talk to you about sabbaticals. And I'm going to bait you with, I'm just going to tell you, uh, listen next month, I think sabbaticals are unscriptural. And I'll tell you why. See you next month. Thank you for joining us today. For a free sermon series and teaching outlines by Pastor Dean, visit us at deanhawk.com. Be sure and join us next month as we continue our growth on leadership.